Well, welcome to Chicago Founders here, Stories here at uh, 1871, Chicago's Digital Startup Hub. With me, I have a uh, pillar of our tech community who took me two years. I've been doing this two and a half, so it took me two years to get him to come. Uh, Mark Tebby, the uh, founder of Lante, as well as the co-founder of uh, Answers.com. Mark, great to have you here. Welcome. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for having me. Although if I knew I was going to be called a pillar, I probably would have waited another year or two. <laughs> I really think of myself you. as a pillar. I waited until you got mic'd up. But uh, Mark and I have worked together on a lot of things over the years, and uh, nobody's more committed to our tech community. But his story spans a, a, a lot of years and a lot of interesting, uh, uh, interesting experiences. And so it's great to be able to share this. For those who didn't know, uh, don't know Lante, um, because I know it was sold a number of years ago, uh, what would be the headline for them on what Lante did? Um, we'll get into the whole story, but okay. for a headline. What, the headline, well, one of the reasons why it's taken me a while is because, it, you know, it's been, we sold Lante in 2004. So I, most, you know, I started Lante before a lot of the people in the audience were even born in 1984. So it really <laughs> was one of these, um, you know, I figured it's all past tense. I don't want to be one of those old guys recounting my story. But um, Lante was a technology consulting firm that basically rode the wave of technologies and implementing them for corporate organizations. We started off literally just putting in PC systems for companies in the 1984-86 time frame, moved it into databases, moved it into networks, which seems today so wacky that you even needed to pay someone um, $15 an hour to do, which we did. And um, then we did client server systems, back-end infrastructure of transactional systems, which set the stage to do transactional websites, which set the stage to do websites, which is where people really knew us at doing a lot of great websites. But we basically were a technology advisor firm for corporations. Got it. Great. Well, so you're part of the uh, famous um, U of I uh, alumni base. I think you're in the, I think you might be the U of I Hall of Fame. I, uh, I just won an award this weekend. Um, yeah. They identified the 50 top alumni over the 50 years of the CS department. Chicago, I'm mean, the University of Illinois' um, CS department just celebrated 50 years. So they identified 50 alumni, so I got to be How one do you like that? 50 people out of U of I, and yeah. this is one of them. Fantastic. Well, really great. What also great. great people. Thank you. So he is a Hall of Famer. No, See, that's I, great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I also did the, reason, the Hall of Fame thing. It just hit me. Um, in 2000, I also was in the University of Illinois in Chicago Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, see, so. this is a, it's a great story. But you started um, a long way from uh, uh, the CS department. You grew up on a farm in uh, southern Illinois. Yeah. Um, um, talk a little bit about what, you know, you're growing up, where you grew up, and, and kind of what, what your interests were. Were you the budding entrepreneur from, uh, from day one, or what, what was it like growing up? What's um, the name of your town again? It's called Sawyerville. It's a town of, when I was there, 206. Now it's about 250 people. Um, I went to high school in a town called Gillespie. Again, no one's ever heard of it. It's a town of about 3,000. It took 11 towns to fill my high school, and um, I had a graduating class of 78 kids. Wow. So um, it's a little different of an environment than where we are today. Um, but I basically grew up on a farm. I mean, I was a farm kid. I worked, you know, got up in the morning, fed the animals, went to school, came home, fed the animals. Was it work in the summer? Um, primarily horses, but we also had pigs, cattle, sheep, whatever my dad thought he could make money out. And... But we were, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And so we were in a situation where we we're constantly buying, you know, farm implements from other people, fixing them, which led me to the idea of being able to take things apart, putting them back together. When I was in, um, I don't remember, third grade, I think. Uh, it was 1969 when I was eight years old. I saw the moonshot. Um, the first time we'd ever gotten a TV when I was growing up. And when I was able to see the Apollo 11 moonshot, where it basically took this little piece of steel shot it into the Earth's orbit, circled the Earth a few times, shot it over to the moon, circled the moon a few times, blew a piece off, shot it back up there, flew it back there, and landed within a mile of where they originally thought they were going to do it. I was amazed how that could be done. That got me interested in computers, and that set the stage for learning about it. So go back a second, I mean, because it's a, what an inspiring story, but go back to the, what kind of things would you build with in farm? Like, what, if we, if we had home video of you doing this, like, what are you assembling back and rebuilding back in those days? A baler, a combine, really? pieces of tractors. My grandfather was a blacksmith, so I worked in his blacksmith shop. Really? Um, lots of mechanical things. I mean, we were, you basically, if you had something that had broken the field, you figured out how to fix it. When you bought something that was used, if it was already not, if it wasn't working, you got it at a better price, my dad's like, oh, we can fix this, and we, that's what we would do. What's the hardest thing you ever fixed? Or most, most challenging, most interesting? 
Um, because you love solving engineering problems, so yeah. I'm sure as a kid you had to be like, we were going to get that one. Oh, as a kid. Oh, I thought, because the hardest thing I ever did was we were doing a network over in Hanover, Germany that wasn't working, and it was like a live demonstration of Microsoft's European solution, and it was never to be, it had never been shown before, and it wasn't working until about one minute before. That was the hardest thing I ever fixed. <laughs> but um, we let's got that go, Let's working. go back to, let's to, go back to how to you did this thing. back in the The farm season. thing. Um, just basically pieces of tractor. I mean, I would say probably... The, a multi-stack baler, where basically it would have, you know, it would pick up the, the uh, hay, make bales, spit it out the back, very complex little piece of machinery. And so you're looking at that, you're, you're, uh, you're I mean, you basically, it sounds like someone who would have been a mechanical engineer had you predict, someone predicted at that stage. Because no. you, you're very mechanical in what you're building. So what led you, you became an EE guy. Mm -hmm. So um, how, did, how did that uh, transition from seeing the moonshot uh, to go into U of I, like how did your interest in computers able to manifest itself and, and when you got to U of I, how did that work? Um, so working on the farm gave me the idea of you take things apart, put them back together. But the other piece of it was being able to turn around and do other things that were more interesting, more challenging. Because of my interest in computers, I started playing around with electronics. And I would take and buy little pieces of electronics, take it apart, see how it worked. Um, back then, there was not a radio shacks and things like that. You could go and pick up electronics, let alone be anywhere near my house. Um, so what we would do is I would do get mail order pieces from a place called Priority One Electronics in Chatsworth, California. They would ship me electronic pieces. I'd solder, put it together, make little adders and things like that, little LEDs. And that got me interested in computers and how they could be built. And I always thought that it was interesting if you could have a machine do things that you couldn't do, just like how People use farm implements as a way of giving you an advantage over man, uh, manual labor. The computer gave you the advantage over thinking labor. Hmm. It could take a repetitive task and do it over and over and do it way faster than any human could. And over time, it could start to do branch processing so it could think about things for you and act accordingly. And I just was intrigued by that. So by seventh grade, I started putting together pieces and making multi-adders and computers and the beginnings of computers. Um, and then in high school, started a computer club, which had three members. Um, <laughs> but I basically, you know, built things and just learned about it. And that inspired me to want to go to U of I. I was able to, I got a good scholarship to go to U of I. And I... Um, and so, go, so this is fascinating. First of all, I love the fact that you see the parallel between how farm equipment at this stage right. did it. Because we weren't that many years past when Watson said, Tom Watson said that... Uh, uh, was, was it Thomas what said uh, the world the world market for computers is five yeah we were maybe 10 or 20 we're 15 20 years past that so you saw the parallel between the leverage you got on the farm from right. the equipment to what computers could do at a time when people thought it was back office type equipment um, or they just didn't have it a lot of time when I first started I, I'll move that jumping way ahead but I mean when the, we one of the very first spreadsheet implementations and it's an amazing concept I mean one of the reasons why I've avoided this is it sounds like so old school but one of the very first spreadsheet applications ever done in the city of Chicago was done for Arthur Anderson. I was an intern, and that was the project I worked on. And we built a spreadsheet to model Arthur Anderson's unit allocation worldwide. It was fascinating, because before we had it on the spreadsheet, and they could say, what if we added three new partners in Spain? It would just whip up the answer. They had seven people sitting at desks with manual ledgers that they basically calculated with a punch, tin, pull tape, 10 key, to verify their work. It was just astonishing how this one device could do the work of those seven, and what might have taken them about 45 minutes to calculate could be done in about 30 seconds. And so back then, I just any time you can have a machine that is able to em empower you to do more than what you're humanly possible, it's a good thing. But you're seeing a lot from the farm. I mean, that's pretty impressive. So you're uh, in your computer club, three of you. Um, what'd you guys do? We built pieces of computers and basically showed how if you could, you know, take a little adder and type in a number and type in another number, you could multiply them together and the number would show up on a little LED, LCD screen and or LED screen at that point. And it was just astonishing to people. And it was astonishing to me. I mean, that, that was like, I was blown away that you could do that. Now, this is back in, what, 76. So, I mean, the other, the other two but people go into technology? Yeah, both of them are. As a matter of fact, one worked for Intel for 30 years, and the other one worked in a couple different technology companies. But yeah, 
that, oh, one worked for McDonnell uh, Douglas, which became part of Boeing, wow. and then what switched out somewhere about five years ago. But the thing about that was the ability to have these computers that can begin to do the thinking for you was just fascinating to mm -hmm. me. But it was even more than that. I mean, you could have an entire room of people calculating what the Earth was doing, what the moon was doing, how they were revolving around each other, and one little faux pas, and these, you know, those guys in the space capsule would have been lost. The computer did it so accurately. Even when they improvised on the moon and they landed in the wrong spot, they were able to like flip around and think about it in a, a different way and automatically recorrect. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it was just astonishing. And the, the technology of that, you look at all the mainframes and all the processing power they had today, and you've got about 100 times that processing power in an iPhone today. You know, or you got more, you know, 10 times more processing power than in a Pebble watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just astonishing how far technology has come in that time frame. That's but it was really the same sim simple premise. Get a, com get a machine to do some of the work for you so you don't have to do it all. Better than you could do it yourself. So why did you start EE then when you got to U of I? Um, electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. You did your homework well. Um, at the, um, I started in electrical engineering because I basically wanted to build things. And I thought... I can go off and put something together and build something. So I did. So I, was, I went and I met a bunch of professors. I said, I'm here, I'm a freshman, I want to build something. And I got assigned to a professor who grew up by about 30 miles from my parents' house. Um, and he basically said, I've got this chip. It's called a Votrax chip. Um, here's what it should do. Here's the spec sheet. I've got a couple grad students who's working on it. Why don't you work with them? I'm like, OK. So they say, what, is, what does it do? It speaks. I'm like, really? That's kind of cool. You can basically hook it up to some other electronics, and these little pulses become a voice. And now, the people who might be older than one, the not being born before, you know, before I started Lante would remember the TI speak and say, where you could type in a word yeah, sure. and press talk, and it, would sound, and, you know, it would say the word. It was an amazing concept at the time. So I said, ah, that's cool. And so I worked with a system called the Plato system, which was used for teaching. And the professor said, what would happen if someone it, it walked up to me, and, you know, I was sitting there, and he's like, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. So he said, here, take your glasses off. Now read me the screen. I can't read when my glasses are on. So he's, he's like, what if someone didn't have glasses? How would they be able to interact with that, that machine? It, it should be able to talk to him. This chip can do that. You guys have to figure out how to make that happen. And that's what we did. That's really and I cool. did it in my freshman year as an engineering open house project. Did very well in the competition. And so I said, wow, I really like this. But in doing it, we built the hardware device, which was one thing, and then we built the software that sat around it. And I learned a couple things in that process. One, building hardware is based on the, physics, the, the laws of physics. And they're called laws for a reason. You don't get to break them. Mm -hmm. When you go into software, there are no laws of software. You can do anything you want as long as you can write the program to do it. So with that, I said, oh, you know what? That's fun, but this is way more fun. And I switched from that to computer science. Well, you got, uh, you're quite prescient in all these choices. They're really uh, interesting. You know, it's, uh, I heard Mark Andreessen talk about Plato. What, tell, what, explain what that is. Plato was, it stood for Program Logic Automated Teaching Operation. And what it was, was it was a plasma screen device that, well, eventually became plasma screen, um, that allowed you to do automated instruction. And Andreessen spoke, speaks to it because in his freshman year, when he came from Wisconsin, he was at U of I, and he became a, um, a Plato programmer for a year. Hmm. And what it basically did is it did language, I'm sorry, it did um, lesson plans for things like languages, economics, physics, which was a big popular, chemistry. And you could simulate this on the screen. So and like so, what would be an example of how someone would you know, interact with it? Let's say, um, well, how they would interact. Or how, yeah, like what was the use case? The use case for it would be, let's take someone in a chemistry class, okay? If you're having a chemistry class and you want to do a titration in a chemistry uh, lab, you have to basically, you know, deal with it and you can measure it. And so you, you take your base chemical, you titrate it in, you mix it up, you put it there, you take a measurement and the like. If you do it wrong, you could blow things up or something. So they always want to do it in a lab and stuff <laughs> like that. But getting lab time was expensive. Mm -hmm. If I could get a computer program that basically knew all the principles of what it was, knew what the base compound was, titrate it. You could say, I'm going to titrate it with two milliliters. It would show two little milliliters dropping in. And it basically, I'm going to measure it. You could take the little device and pretend to measure it. And it would tell you what it was. And so you could do your whole lesson plan and never need to touch a chemical in the wow. lab. So it was basically a virtual lab. 
it was used as a virtual lab. But if you were doing Spanish, we had these floppy disks that were every bit this big around that slid in the top that were basically 30 minutes of audio recording. And it would basically do sound. So you could you know, do um, a French lesson. And you could hear the French word. And it would whirl around, find the right little bit, and then read it back to you, play a little audio clip back to you. Wow. And it was, it was a great way for people to learn. And economics and all these different um, sciences used them. And it was <laughs> a great way to empower students to learn without having to go into lab. Because I could, you know, if I didn't understand the chemistry, I didn't have to wait till I had lab time. I could go into the, to the Plato lab at 1.30 really in the morning and work on it. And it was developed at? It was developed at U of I. That, it started back in the um, early 60s, and it was on at U of I through the mid-80s. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. U of I is a great hotbed of technology. We're very really fortunate is. to have Champagne so close. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So, but, so you switched from electrical engineering to computer science, mm -hmm. and then you decide that um, majoring in computer science at one of the top engineering schools in the world wasn't fast enough, so you took a basically a virtually full time job. No, I wasn't or, quite that way of thinking about it. But that, God, you, I'm really you did well. Um, I did work full time through school, but for a different reason. Okay. I grew up on a farm. I didn't have any money. By the middle of my, by the end of my freshman year, I'd run out of money. Even though I had a scholarship that paid all my tuition and all my fees, I still had to pay books. Oh, and room too. I had to pay books and spending money and the thing like that. I didn't have a lot of money, so I worked at a job. I, I, at this point in my college career, I'm bartending. So it <laughs> shows you the difference why he was so much more successful so much faster. I don't know about that. So, um, but, um, but, but I would love to do a – can I do a founder story where I interview you? Not nearly interesting enough. Oh, Let's I think it would be. This. But back to this. All right, so I would think that would be fun. But basically, um, I started working just as a way of making money so I could have spending money and the like. And also I stayed on through the summers and worked there as well. And so um, you worked at Arthur Anderson? I worked at, no, I, well, I started, I worked originally for the, my, after this, doing this Plato project, I'm sorry, after doing this, yeah, the Plato project my freshman year, um, the Department of Defense went to the engineering open house, they said, we really like this, we want you to come work for us. Wow. And, and so I worked on graphics routines for the Department of Defense, um, this, my summer of my freshman year, um, and all of my sophomore year, and then they want, I didn't want to go to Washington anymore, like go back and forth to Washington, so I switched and I got to work for the Department of uh, Agriculture and Energy. And I did that um, summer of sophomore year, all of my junior year. And then um, I realized I didn't want to work for the government. Not only did I not want to work for the Department of Defense, I didn't want to work for the government. So I left that and said I want to do something. And consulting. Consulting, for those that don't understand, is really good. It's really good for people with short attention spans because you do a lot of things in a small window of time. And you meet a lot of interesting people in the process. So I went to work for our, there was two at the time to look at. EDS and Arthur Anderson. I wanted to, if I'm going to work, I'm going to work for the best there is. And this is before Accenture spun out of oh, Arthur yeah, Anderson. This, well, this is before Anderson Consulting spun out of And Arthur Anderson. Right. And this is before yes. Arthur Anderson blew himself up by doing you know bad judgment. But well, this is like this is long. This is long time ago. So um, I basically said, all right, I'm going to go work for him. Went up, got an interview, got the job. At the end of my internship, they said we really like you. Um, this thing you built, the spreadsheet thing you built, boy, will you be able to help us? Sure. I got a job offer, and I was able to work 30 hours a week my senior year in college. Wow. Awesome. And so I never interviewed anywhere else. I never, I never wrote a resume. <laughs> so until just recently, about three years ago, I had to write a resume for um, a job. I was, when I applied to University of Chicago, they would not let me apply without a resume. And so I'd never written one before until then. <laughs> so, you're, uh, so you're working at Arthur Anderson, mm -hmm. and what are you working on? I was working, I had become a, a pet of a few of the partners there because I was doing this, these uh, microcomputers. They were just starting to get talked about. So I worked on microcomputer projects all around the world. I was in the World Headquarters Consulting Group, a group called TSO, Technical Services Organization. Which is up here in Chicago? Which is in Chicago. Yeah, Arthur Anderson was started So you were going back and forth? Um, at, sure. During my senior year of, high yeah. school, of college? Yeah. Yeah, I would be, I'd work down there with a um, thermal paper printer and a modem. Um, and I'd work um, sporadically on different things, and a lot of times I'd come up here for a day or two a week. Got and it. So I did that for the, and then I worked there full time afterwards. But your career afterwards wasn't as long. You had an interesting. Um, how long were you at Arthur Anderson after you graduated college? Um, let's see. I graduated in May. I went to work literally on the Monday after I graduated, and so it was the end of May, and I left in the August the following year, but for a good reason. I mean, I right, no, you were there a year, but you, so this is interesting. I mean, 
there's a theme you can see with Mark here, which is he has a great sense of where the, to use the Wayne Gretzky, where the puck is going versus where the puck is. So, um, so you, don't, you don't like basically where Arthur Anderson has you focused. No, I loved where I had my focus. Well, you, you enjoyed it, but you, actually, you came to say to them, I don't want to spend my time on this. I want to spend my time on something else, no. right? Okay, no. what'd you do? I, you were there a year. You didn't get that part of this. You're the most famous alum who was there for a year. They, I, by the way, Art, the Accenture people, he's a very proud alum. And so when I went to talk to him about this, I'm like, so how many years were there? He's like, well, it was a little more than a year, except plus my internship. All right. So, you know, they, they, you'd think you were there for 20 years the way they are proud of you. They, they talk a lot about it. So, um, <laughs> formally, I was there the summer of my junior to senior year, my entire senior year, and then a year and a, three months after that. Okay. And I thought, and, and for those that would know back then, you basically every year went in for your annual review. So I'm going in at the end of June, beginning of July for my annual review. I'm thinking, I am doing butt kicking work. I am doing awesome stuff, and I'm going to do, I'm going to get promoted. You know, because look, I'm flying, I'm teaching these uh, new technologies out in St. Charles, which was a training facility, you know, that they taught everyone in the world out in St. Charles. I was flying all around the world. They sent me to a grooming school so I could have dinners with partners and doing big deals. Like I'm sorry, they like sent you to what? A grooming school. You didn't have that either. I have never been to grooming school. You Tell didn't me need about it. grooming school. You we got to talk it. about grooming school. I basically, I never, you know, when you grow up on a farm, you don't learn how all the forks and knives and everything work. And if you're a young kid and you don't do that, they, you lose some credibility. Oh. So they sent me to a place down in Atlanta where I learned how to, like, which glass to drink from. How long, how long do you go for? Uh, it was for four days. Four days. Yeah. And so four days of And like they also taught me how to dress. Arthur Anderson at that time had a dress code, and they specifically had what you could wear and what you could not wear to work. What, where's the line on back in the day? Back in the day? Um, when I started as an intern, you had to wear a white shirt. And so we Texas decided come a the, long way. Yeah, techs come phenomenally <laughs> long. That's why you don't find me in a suit a lot. But um, basically, we decided in our internship that we were going to buck this trend. We had was seven interns that summer, and we thought, we're all going to wear one day. We're not wearing a white shirt. And if they want to fire all seven interns, that would be great publicity on, on campus. So we all wore a difficult, like different non-white non shirts. Oh, my God. You and guys was, are crazy. It was wacky doodle. <laughs> So, wow. So anyway, but so then they, a year later, they allowed you to wear non-white shirts. <laughs> but you still had to have a suit. And you couldn't have buttons on your shirt. You so four days can't be just about forks and glasses. What did you do for four days? <laughs> Come on. This is a great story. By the way, there's no question that they prepared you to be able to marry Robin, because if you did not know this, I don't think you would have made it through the first date. <laughs> That's probably true. Um, so the... He has high standards. Yeah. <laughs> Barely made them. So, so they, you know, how do you, how do you enter a room? You know, when you okay. walk into a room, how do you introduce yourself? How do you hand them your business card? Dep and by nationality. I mean, there's different ways to hand your business card. Mm -hmm. If someone is Japanese, how you present your card. How you, if someone's Indian, how you presented your card. If someone was English, how you presented your card. Those type of things. When you're at a meal, how, how do you, you? How do you enter a room? How do you enter a room? Yeah, what's the right way to? I, I need to learn this. How's you don't right? need to learn this. No, what's the right way to enter a room? Seriously, I can't Seriously, this is unbelievable. About this. This is you didn't great. get this in your back. No. <laughs> I. You walk in the room. You always face the. You know, you walk in, shoulders back. Da 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 da. You know, they didn't put the books on my head or anything. So let's go something else. That's. <laughs> this is amazing. Wow. I love this. So they sent you to grooming school. Now you know why I waited two years to even do this. <laughs> This is the color that makes these stories so fascinating. Obviously. So they send you to grooming school. This is a good sign. That, yeah, I thought so. So I'm like, right. they have, I am doing, I mean, I mean, I got to fly. I had never been on an airplane before I went to work for, you know, the, the government. I had never really hardly ever left the state of Illinois. Uh -huh. So I'm getting flown. They're like, we need you to have, go to this a meeting in London for the next day. So we're going to fly you out tonight. You're going to go to London, and then you're going to fly back. I'm like, that's an amazing concept. And so I thought, that, and I got to go business class too. So I got wow. to sleep, I, and that was like wacky. So I'm like, all right, I'm, they're putting all this money in me. I am getting promoted. So I go in to my partner who sits down and says, you're doing a fabulous job. I'm like, this is awesome. We really think the stuff you've done is very innovative. It's really helpful. You really are pushing a new envelope on the front. I'm like, this is good. And then they said, however, you need to work in a line position in order to get promoted. And so we want to talk about how in the next year or two, we're going to get you transformed 
into a line rule. You can do some COBOL programming. You'll start with coding sheets and you'll be able to move up. And then you'll work on that. And then you'll work as part of a PSD, preliminary system design. And you'll be able to work on a mainframe project. That's really where the future of technology is really empowering. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, no, no, no. I said microcomputers. They weren't even PCs yet. Microcomputers are really where it's going to be. He's like, no. The only good application running on a microcomputer for this firm is a terminal emulation program, and it connects to a mainframe. I was blown away. And I said, so I'm not getting promoted? No. But in net, if you do a really good job in a year, you might. But in two, you probably will be. I'm like, I'm not waiting that long. And so I said, you know, I want to work on microcomputers. You, well, if you do that, you'll never be promoted. See, I'd heard the microcomputer story. I hadn't heard the. Well, there's only two people in the room. Uh, the partner in charge, who yeah. won't admit to it anymore, me <laughs> and God. <laughs> So and God, you did, you could. I heard you were. I always. I'd always heard that you were early on understanding the death of the mainframe. I was. I thought the microcomputers could really change the way people worked, and so I basically at that point said, I can't work here. And he's like, What do you mean? I said, I'm giving notice. And I said, I'll finish up what I'm committed to because I had a bunch of projects that were kind of lingering on. I didn't want to leave them hanging. And I said, I'm giving notice. I'm quitting. In the meeting, you said. In that? the meeting. I then so the meeting you went into saying, I'm going to get, get promoted. promoted. I wonder how much money I'll make in my fancy new job. Right. And you leave without a job I quit. and without a plan. I had no game plan. Wow. Yeah. You really were pretty confident. Good fortune. No, that whole, no. Well, that's I, good. Well, yeah. I, listen, it's, but I mean, it's, that's, that's courage of conviction, man. That's an entrepreneur in the making. It was more, I really liked what I was doing. and I thought it really could make a difference. And, I, and, and what we were seeing in technology, what was coming along, was really changing the way people could work. And I thought, I want to be there. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I went, might have ended up in some, I, and I literally, remember, I didn't have a resume, I didn't have an interview for a job. And so I thought, I don't, fuck, I'm really up a creek here. I, and so I thought, I'll start doing some consulting. I know a lot of people. I'll just, till I figure out what I want to do, I'm going to just start taking on some projects. Mm -hmm. So I, I would go out and talk to people about what they were doing. And... You know, I, you know, Tebby and Associates was the business card, I, you know, that I made. Did and you have any associates when you started? God, you're like, I get that question all the time. Um, I'd go meet with people and they'd go, oh, Tebby, oh, how old are you, Mr. Tebby? I'm 23. Oh, yeah, you look really, you look really young. Um, how many associates do you have? I have none. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Aspirational type. Right. And so I learned an important thing. If you're going to put an associates, you know. So I actually found a friend of mine who had quit. Arthur Anderson right before to work on a software program. And I, he was complaining about how he couldn't get his application working and how it, his commute from his living room, uh, from his bedroom to his living room was really frustrating. I said, I'll help you. He goes, really? He goes, I don't have any money. I said, I'll tell you what, not a problem. Here's what I need. I need to borrow your name. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? I said, no one will hire Tebby and Associates. Outside of the fact, ignoring totally that you've got to remember, and this is important when you like, you've already done it with naming kids, but name kids and stuff, Think through all the alternatives. Never name your business TNA. It never works. <laughs> you hear, the two questions you have is, how many associates do you have, and why did you pick TNA? It just <laughs> never works. So, and then, because again, we didn't have you know, scheduling. It was all done, daytimers written out in itself. So, and Teddy and Associates was kind of long to write, so they just wrote TNA, and it was never good. But anyway, so. They're we, like, look at this smart ass kid. Yeah. And so, but invariably, when I said, and so I told this guy, I want to use your name. So Andy Langer let me use his last name of Langer, Tebby and Associates. And now I'd go in and talk to people. And they'd say, well, who do you work? I'm Langer, Tebby and Associates. Oh, Langer, who is he? And I'd describe that he was a partner at Anderson. He had, was working on this. And he's, at that time, he was 38. He's 15 years older than me. He was ancient. Right. And so awesome. And then I had credibility. And then all of a sudden, they would talk to me. And they'd say, you know, we are just looking at these microcomputers. We're thinking about doing this. Do you think it could do something like this? Yes, it could. Well, what, how much would it take for have you do that? How would you do that? So I had to describe it, and then we'd end up getting a project. I had no associates, as you just pointed out. I'd have to do the work at night that I sold during the day. So I was kind of humping it a little bit. Then I hired a part-time person. Then I got more work. So someone said, I want to work for you. So they came, and I had a full-time person. How'd you learn how to sell? I wanted to make money. I wanted to be alive. <laughs> you know, if you don't sell, you don't make money. But programmers are not famous for their sales skills, so that's... I was in Anderson for, two, for at least a year and a half where I went out and watched some of the best partners in the world sell to clients hopes and dreams of what could do. 
And the bottom line is people have either a problem that needs to be solved or a need they would like to address. If you can solve that problem, then you can basically, they will want to work with you. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so well I, early on, that's all I ever Tweet focused that out. on. That's good. I, you know what? That's funny you say that. I, I, I was probably number, I don't know, 14,000 on Twitter, which sounds like a very high number, but it really isn't. I've never wrote a single tweet. Really? That's a tweet. Start with no, that No, I'm not going to start with That's that That's great advice. I've never put a tweet out there because, you know, the same reason why, I'm not, why I avoided coming up here. I don't need to talk about myself. I don't, people could care less what I'm eating for dinner or anything else like that, you know, or what uh, my own epiphany is about well, that. Somebody, what did you have for dinner? Do you have any pizza? We'll, we'll tweet it. Someone need, else here will tweet it out for you. You know what? I was going to eat pizza, but I decided <laughs> I didn't want to because I'd get stained, and then I'd get yelled at for having stain on my shirt. Yes. Well, you'd be on, you know, be on video for, yeah. for good. The, um, well, I, th I think that's great advice, though. I do think, you know, I'm, I'm uh, involved with Chicago Ventures, and every week or two we have companies come in, and I think one of the things that I find people miss when we don't invest is they don't take that fundamental wisdom you just described. I wasn't kidding about tweeting it. It's really great wisdom. Mm -hmm. It sounds so obvious, but often the most profound wisdom sounds obvious but isn't applied because people don't understand its importance. And that idea of people have a problem to be solved, or something they're looking to achieve, and you know, the more important that is, the more painful that is, um, the more profound. And I, I see companies all the time that have what sounds like a great idea, but they're not solving anybody's problem. If they can't describe the problem, they don't have a solution. That's right. And if they can't have the empathy to get into the, the arms of the customer, in the shoes of the customer, and think like the customer, they haven't done their homework well enough. I think, I think you know, Rishi Shaw said that up here when I yeah, interviewed Rishi. Rishi. And he talked about empathy, and I think empathy is the perfect word to describe. If you can empathize with your user, you can do great things. Excellent. And if you can't, it'll sound tone deaf. The example I give is uh, if you fly out of Midway, our, our mutual friend Brian Kyle who founded the Bill Potbelly, you, the Potbelly always has a line out the door. If you go to Terminal 1 at O'Hare and you go to the Sea Concourse, there's a Potbelly knockoff that never has anybody in line. Right. They have the same toaster ovens, the same kind of bread, the same kind of meat, the same kind of vegetables. Well, BK tell you that because he'll tell you their meats are all different and the breads are all different. Well, they've gotten there because yeah. it's so it's so poor, but they've never been able to sort of get the nuance right. Right. In theory, they've got you know they they say they got the same things, but that that ability to understand it internally, viscerally, I think is so profound. That's what made Lante what it was. I mean, our job we had no ego. We didn't say we were doing this better than anyone else. Our job was we were a bunch of people who really enjoyed technology, and the best way to use, put technology to use is to help people solve their problems. And you could relish in their success. And so that's what we did. So Lante came from Langer Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Langer Tebby Associates. A year later, Andy comes back and says, guess what? Pricewaterhouse wants to buy my software application and build it out. I need my name back. I'm like, I'm not going back to Debbie and Associates. <laughs> and so I, under the auspices that people used to take Debbie and Associates to make TNA, we decided to make Lante. L-A-N from Langer, T-E from Tebby. It passed the Thompson Thompson trademark search, which you never do anymore. You, now you just see, do I, can I get the domain? But back then, we didn't have domains. It was all Thompson Thompson. Passed the legal search, and it was kind of a fun thing because if you think about L apostrophe A-N-T, it means the initial bet, the ante. Oh, so nice. I always thought it was kind of a cool little thing. I never really brought up to people because it could obviously For be used against me. the guys hosting a charity poker tournament tomorrow night. Yeah, so, but it was basically a good way, you know, and that was the bet. I was betting I could pull this off. And so that, Lante was born, and at that point it was 90, I'm sorry, it was 86, no, yeah, 86, and it's been Lante until we sold. So you went through a number of different incarnations as technology evolved, and we don't have to go through all of them, but I'd love to understand you know, thinking about where the focus was, moving to what became, was then known as the microcomputer, mm -hmm. and then focusing into the PC, and then we moved to the web and websites, uh, transactional databases. Um, of all the challenges you took, what of those moves, is there one of those moves that you feel like was your best? Like, boy, when we, when we made the, put the focus on this, skated to where we thought this was going to be, that was our most prescient move or most critical move and, and, and what, it, what about that um, you know, allowed you to, to give, gave you that insight before you made that decision? That's a good question. Um, I would say we were very fortunate. I mean, when I started in this industry, it was very small. I mean, I met a lot of people. You know, and I, and we're gonna, there's some great stories yeah, to cover, but, which we'll get oh, to. Oh, great. Um, but, no pictures, I promise. 
Why not? I have people bring <laughs> pictures in too. Um, so I think when it, we made the move to the web, the web was in, you know, we, we started in 91, 92, starting to work with the internet technology before it was pre-web, when we were just using IP as a way of exchanging and interconnecting. So Lante started careers. working with the internet in 91, 92. Um, we started, yeah, the, the, the foundation of the internet, the TCP IP component of it. And um, we had a couple different clients that really pushed us that way. And that really set the stage for our thinking of what we could do. And we started thinking about how you could take broad computer systems between companies and also between users and companies and connect them. It didn't happen until mid to light. And we tried to do it. I mean, we tried to basically extend the web through modems. We built a configurator for a Dell computer in 1991. So the Dell could basically take orders for the customized systems. And the modem was too slow to do it, even though it was the fastest modem it was, 15, 15, 115 kilobits per second. It was too slow to do the processing over uh, the period of time before the phone line was dropped. And so it didn't work. But that mindset set the stage so that in 95, when Dell said, we want to do this again and we want to use the internet to do it, and web was out there, we were able to do that. And that, that led to the Dell configurator. We had all the back end infrastructure right. We just had to work on getting the front end infrastructure right. Um, and so that was, that was a good move. But at the same time, we had gotten approached. Um, we had done a lot of work with Sybase at the time. And when Microsoft and, and um, Ashton and Sybase got together to announce SQL Server, we were probably the country's experts on it, I mean, hmm. bar nine. And um, so we were out there leading it. And so we wrote a lot of the demo applications for Microsoft, which then led them to do it. So that, I think, the fact that we were able to use the database before most people thought about using it in that way. And when you put those two together, that sets the stage for transactional websites, which, where the roofs just blew off the roof. So the tra that that's interesting. So Dell uh, was a big piece of that, though, and that was that was critical. I, I really, yeah. We and and, and Microsoft, interestingly, I mean, you, I know you were a test cust you were a test customer for a lot of Microsoft software, a lot of mm -hmm. test cases. Um, when did you meet Bill Gates? First. Um, first time was in 1977, here in Chicago. I came up from my 19, parents' house. 1977. 77. Um, he was here for the National Computer Conference, NCC, and I was, I was kind of going through because I was intrigued by computers. I drove up, I, no, I didn't even drive up here. I took the train up here, I went over there, and I walked it through it, and he was, I met him. And how old were you then? I was still in high school, I was 16. So you're in high school, you take the train to Chicago, you meet this guy named Bill Gates who I had a company. A lot of huh? I met a lot of people, but I did meet yeah. Bill Gates. Yeah, so this is, I mean, that's amazing. I was very and fortunate. So, and so, but there was It's not like it was an overwhelming. It's not like it was CES where there was 120,000 people. No, no, if there was like maybe 600, 700 people there, that was a big number. So you meet Bill Gates. When did you start working with with Microsoft and with Bill Gates? Um, Bill Gates, 77. I thought he was interesting, and so I basically always had him in the back of my mind. In 80, um, I did the the spring of 80. I did the project. So the fall of 80, I got contacted. A written letter from someone in his office saying, Bill is coming to do some recruiting at U of I. We understand that you know him. Would you host him? Wow. And so, sure. I was, running the, I was running the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery student chapter there. I just resurrected it for undergrads, and I was in president of it. I was actually chairman of it. And, um, and I, so I said, sure. So we had a meet and greet, basically, with Bill Gates for people who might want to work at Microsoft. And how big, how big was Microsoft, do you think, then? When I met him in 77, he had 16 employees. And by 80, he had maybe 300, 400. Wow. So you meet Bill Gates. And then when did you start working with him at Lante? Um, after I, when I, I quit Anderson and I basically said I got to do something, I reached out to him and said, hey, look, <laughs> I don't have a job. He's like, move to Seattle. You can have a job. I'm like, I can't move to Seattle. I'm staying in Chicago. Um, no, but I'd love to work with you. And I, would, I did our first project with him in 86 or 87. 87. It was announced, yeah, because the, the Ashton Tate announcement was in 86, so it was the spring of 87. And uh, what was the project? 
we did the demo applications for the SQL Server. Oh wow! So all the all the sample apps we worked on those starting in '87. So you've known Bill Gates a long time since before he was the famous legendary Bill Gates. Um, what's the thing that you would say the big public persona of Bill Gates that, that's known today that people that's missed in that sort of public persona? That, of it? What, what do you think people don't understand about Bill Gates and they just read about him in popular press today? He's one of the smartest people I know. He, is, he has an amazing ability to, to consume data, to consume knowledge, reshape it, and regurgitate it back in a way that I've never seen in anyone. He is super, super brilliant. I spent a weekend with a group with him a couple years ago, and I remember trying to take notes of just the books he was sort of digesting oh. and feeding back to us. And I couldn't keep up writing with his sort of just explaining the interesting ideas and why they fit into the conversation we're having. At some point, somebody actually raised their hand and said, could somebody record this so we could just get the books to read? Because well, it was incredible. I mean, the amount of information he consumed that could synthesize oh. was... He would go on vacations. I mean, I, like, one time I knew he was going on vacation, he went to Brazil with his girlfriend. I'm thinking, this is pretty nice. You know? <laughs> He's going to Brazil with his girlfriend, you can't beat that. He took a stack of books this tall. She complained the whole time about all he did was lay down on the beach at Copacabana Beach and read books. I mean, it, but that's, he has an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think he's made the move, yeah, I know he came back into Microsoft recently, but why he made the move from Microsoft into the foundation was because he wants to make a difference, and that's an area which, he, if he puts his focus to and applies, he will make a difference. I mean, I would not want to be malaria right now, because he is going to make malaria disappear before he's dead. It's amazing. I was also surprised by, we, he just stepped down from Microsoft when we were with him. Like, I want to say it was the summer after he did it. Okay. And I remember him talking, he had a question about his time at Microsoft, and he said, you know, I, he didn't enjoy running kind of the big scale thing. He loved being the entrepreneur. And you could feel that, but what you could really feel off of him was how passionate he was about how Microsoft technologies made people's lives better. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was incredible. You know, he had, there was a bit of an image of he was this sort of this master corporate chess player and strategist, but he loved product and what it did for people. Yeah. It was amazing. I was with him one time back in 07, right when the iPhone came out. And I had the, the original iPhones. And he grilled me for 45 minutes. Why would I use an iPhone? He's like, I have a healthy respect for what you know and what you think, you think about things. I don't know why you would ever choose such a product. Windows could do so much more. And I explained, I went literally through all the different pieces and the nuances, what I thought about the design, and explained to him in gory detail why I thought it was a better product. He could not conceive that it was a better product, but he could consume what made it appear to be a better product to, in other people's eyes, not in his eyes. Well, and so go with that because Microsoft's product history is really interesting, which is they always end up win they always end up in their heyday winning their market, but they didn't always start with a product that felt like it was going to be the winner in the no. market. What do you what did you learn about the way they did product that what did they do well and what did they have to overcome as part of winning those markets? Um, they fell into the premise of and, and some people still do this, but a lot of people learned that it's not a good idea. They fell into the premise of building what they thought was going to be cool rather than listening to what the customers were wanting. They understood the use cases to a high level, but they didn't drill as deep as they could have. So they built what they thought was really cool, innovative technology built by a bunch of engineers and said, here you go. This is cool technology. People use it and go, it's nice, but it sucks. And so that was a V1 product. They, they make some bug fixes in V11. Yeah. Then they go, we got it. V2, we've, got, we've heard you. We're going to fix this, this, this. Eh, it's better, but it still kind of blows. And then by the time they got to V3, it was usually pretty good. And what did they do by V3? Were they, just, were they, they understanding why people liked other products? They watched how people went out and used the product, and they were able to digest how the use cases should have been done in the first round. And more than that, they looked at what the alternatives, because at that time, people had, a, you know, there was no new technology. It was new solutions for a problem, but people still had the problems. And they would look and see how they were trying to do it. But that's, at that point, by the time they were out a couple revs, they were able to see it in the user's hands and really understand it better. So you, um, we were talking before this, we just covered a little, couple things. I talked a little bit about Bill Gates, and of course, people think of Bill Gates as the wealthiest man in the world. Yes. He, um, he is the wealthiest man in the world. Um, and you think of all these, you know, images you see of it. But what was Bill Gates like in the 1980s? 
If he ever sees this video, I'm dead. <laughs> we'll, cut, we'll cut it from the video, I promise. <laughs> um, Bill Gates is amazingly frugal. I, I, I probably would be too upset about it, but he is amazingly frugal. Um, some people would say he's cheap. I'll call it frugal. He's extremely sensitive of money, his money particularly. And so if we would, one time I was out there. That's a good entrepreneur. It's a great entrepreneur. His yes, but he grew up well. I mean, people forget. He went to, he learned about computers going to a private school. It was not the cheapest school. It was, as a matter of fact, the most expensive school in Seattle. So it's not like he didn't have money. But we would go out, we'd meet at the office, we'd go to Burgermaster, which is the, the burger place right next door, and then we'd go back to, you know, back to his place. We didn't stay in hotels. Most people just said, you could crash on my house. This is pre-Airbnb. You just sleep right there. And so it all worked out. Um, but we'd stop and we'd buy something. So one time we stopped, and he goes, well, wait, wait. And he's digging through his pockets, ruffling through, and he says, I got a coupon. I'm like, get out. But he always would, like, he would read the paper, and he'd always tear out coupons. He'd always have them with him. It was just kind of funny. That's hilarious. Well, you didn't build Microsoft without, he, that tells you something. No, he's immensely frugal. He would not have been the guy, you know, doing the free catered meals to all the, like, uh, like I don't think stuff. Microsoft still does free catered meals to their employees. No, they're, they, um, they're very sensitive of the value. But look at, you know, if you look at the business, I mean, the cash that they were able to generate off of the, the two monopolistic kind of products that they might have had, you know, they did real well. And it was by controlling their costs. So talk about um, how important was Microsoft to you building Monte in, in that relationship? I always had a respect for Microsoft. I was, it was important. Microsoft was pushing the envelope. If you go back, today people kind of like, oh, there's an aura of Apple. But um, if you go back into the late 80s to mid 90s, Microsoft was it. I mean, they basically dominated the market. And we had a front row seat. We had a group of, you know, you, you've got Andrew coming up, you know, but, and there's a lot of them in place. I mean, Lante over the years, we have 37 startups here in Chicago that are direct lineage of, of Lante. We had a group that was very innovative, ran by, by Chris Dalton. Well, actually ran by John Meyer, but Chris Dalton worked in there. And he ran a lot of our projects there. Where we would do things called ShowNet. And we would build demonstrational uh, labs, mail, email systems, and the like, where people could go and try out the new technology. They'd announce it on this big stage, and then you could go into the lab and try it. Or you could see how email worked. Because Microsoft bought an email product. They didn't build it on their own. And so you could see how it would work. And we built the labs at Demona. So by doing that, we always had a front row seat of what was coming. That was critical for us to be able to know. If you, if you kind of have a picture of where a product's going to be in like six to nine months, make skate, skating to that puck where it's going to be a lot easier. Interesting. And so we leveraged that for what it was. But we also did the same thing with IBM. We also did it with Lotus. We also did it with a lot of other companies. That's great. So um, another really well-known um, person uh, that you worked a lot with and know well, Michael Dell. Yeah. Um, talk about how you met Michael Dell and, and sort of how that relationship evolved. And what was he like back in the day when he was creating, before he was Michael Dell, one of the wealthiest, most famous people in the world? He's always been Michael Dell. But um, um, he... Okay. I met everybody else. Yeah. Like, we only know him as a persona. Okay, so I met him. He started Dell in 86. I met him in 87 at a technology conference put on by uh, Esther Dyson. We were both young. We talked to each other and kind of just hit it off. And he's like, I'm building computers. They're called PCs Limited. They're kind of cool. We had a customer, Amico, when they used to have the Amico building, um, who basically was always looking for the fastest and best technology. And so we introduced them to PCs Limited saying, we think this is awesome technology. And look, it's all these parts. So if something goes wrong, you just pull it up, put it right back in. You can build it the way you want it, and it's fast. I mean, you think IB whatever you can do with your IBM PC, this is four times faster. And so Amico tried it out, went through their tech lab. They loved it. And a year and a half, about a year later, so late 89, early 90, Amico was probably 14% of Dell's revenue worldwide. Wow. And so this was a big attention. We were the ones who were, like, doing all the work for them. So Michael Dell, we would go down on tours. We were down on a tour one time with Amico, and they pointed out that, hey, why are you running all your stuff on um, these tandem terminals? Why aren't you using your own products? We got a project. He said, first thing I want you to do is replace all those terminals, 
put a terminal emulator on our computers so we can use our own computers, and then start the process to rewrite our stuff so that it can be done on you know, our technology. That so took a what, long time. What was Michael like back when he was starting the company in the early days? Like, what, what were your, what, what do you see in him then that made you think he would be as successful as he was or had the kind of success? He was the very, first off, he's immensely shy. People meet him and they're like, oh, yeah, he doesn't have time of day for me. That's not the case. He's a very shy person. Um, and so by being shy, he would just kind of like be a little bit, con uh, you know, contained. He never wanted a big spotlight on him. And he, even today when he does like, you know, the big Dell world and stuff like that, he doesn't like the spotlight on him. So by being shy though, he had, he was very humble. So he would listen really well. I wish I could listen as well as he does because he's really good at it. And he would try a lot of things. His adage was, I'm okay with making a mistake as long as I learn from it and never make it again. And he's done that phenomenally well. Talk, talk about that, um, about kind of that secret of his success. You talked a little bit about that early on. You know, he's got his, he has some technical strengths that allowed him to yeah. understand how to assemble. Talk about, you know, what you saw in him and, and those dynamics of like what, um, you know, he had obviously understood computers to be able to do this, but mm -hmm. talk about the role of sort of his technical knowledge, his business acumen, finance, like what's, what's, what made Michael Dell's early success? What does that, what does that recipe look like? For Everyone probably? thought it was because he was like a technology whiz. He was good at technology, but he was just good enough. He was good at hiring people around him that were way better mm -hmm. and, and basically motivating them to keep doing great stuff. And so I was impressed by his ability to see the big picture, pull it together, understand the technology, motivate others to do it. He was great at, at managing the money and finance, which I was not very good at. So I was always in awe of that. And he was a great listener of customers of what they wanted. And when you put that together, he made him a great executive. When you then add to the fact that he was very you know, numbers driven, and still to this day is, but also very good at motivating people, he became a great entrepreneur. And he, as a result, I mean, sans Larry Ellison, I think he is the longest serving entrepreneur who's the CEO of his company in the technology. Interesting. Um, I've had to go back to one thing, which is uh, we talked when we were, uh, when I talked to you about doing this, a little bit about people forget that um, Bill Gates and role in Steve Jobs' return. And, oh, and you yeah. know that story. That's talk a, great talk story. a little bit about that. Um, all right, so we all know the story. Steve Jobs obviously started with Steve Wozniak, grew the business. Went on and said, do you want to sell you know, sugar water? Do you want to change the world? John Scully gets hired. He gets uh, frustrated because he's losing power. He goes off and creates the Macintosh. Macintosh begins to be a huge hit. He gets fired from the company. We all know that story. Yep. He goes off and does next. Next isn't exactly what you call an overwhelming success. Although Lante spent a lot of time trying to get next machines to work in corporate environments. Um, yeah, so, you gets, to, so you got to know Steve so oh, went back and, and, yeah. you, and you worked with him a lot in the next days. Yeah, I, even before the next days. We are, Lante was Apple developer number seven. Wow. So, and the only reason we're seven is because they had the first 11 of us and they just had it as an alphabetical list. It just happened to be number seven. So, um, nothing magic about the you know, double seven or any of that stuff. Although it is fun when I call in for my Apple tech support and they're like, what's your number? I'm like, 0000000007. The guy's like, no. I'm like, yeah, really, type it in. <laughs> and he's like, cool. So, it's always good for, I can usually get escalation on tech support questions pretty fast. So, um, but basically, we were early on in that. That was in um, the spring of 84 uh, that they launched that program. They didn't formalize it until the summer of 85. And that's when they had 11 of us. Because um, I had originally started working with it at, An at Anderson and then brought it over with what eventually became Lante. And um, so basically, in the course of that, Next wasn't doing well. Apple wasn't doing well. So they decided they needed a new operating system. So they went out and bought Next. He became an advisor to the CEO and eventually became the interim CEO. On the day of the interim CEO announcement back in 97, they had, the board had already released all the other, the, the other CEOs. They had one CEO, they fired him, they brought in another one, she, they fired her, and he was named interim CEO. On the, and it was at a Mac Expo announcement, and he had arranged for Gates to come on, you know, on a video conference with him. Apple was 90 days from being bankrupt. They had no cash in the bank, they had huge debts, they were basically going down. He went, and now at the same time, Gates was in the middle of his little trilogy with the Department of Justice. And um, so they basically said, we need Apple alive. So they put $150 million up. And a, more important than that, 
was a commitment that every Microsoft product that was available on Windows that was already available on Macintosh would be ported to the Mac and kept version for version compatible for the next five years. And with those two pieces, Apple was able to get its footing back. How close was Apple to running out of money? 90 point? days. 90 days from running mm -hmm. out of money. So little known, Bill Gates is the lifeline that gave Steve Jobs the runway to be able to do this. What do you think that, they sold at some point the, what they owned. What do you think that would be worth today? I don't know, but it'd be in the 20 to $30 billion range easily. Um, yeah, that was probably not one of their better days. That was Balmer who made that decision to sell it too. Really? Yeah, yeah. and yeah, it was not probably one of their best financial decisions. Amazing. I have to go, I'll go back to the time I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I, when I first met Mark, um, he had, uh, within the first year I knew you, um, you were in the uh, front section of the Sun-Times for being a billionaire of the dot-com era in Forbes magazine. And uh, I was always impressed. I remember being at a dinner with you and somebody was asking you about it. They're like, oh, you must have jets and mansions. And you're like, it's just paper. It you were grounded the whole way through. At a time, though, when people were not famous for being grounded. Usually people, yeah. you know, whatever the n newspaper or the, you know, magazines that rated wealth said were worth is how they sort of acted. You never, never lost that. But talk about that experience because it was, those were heady days and, and, and certainly Lante was worth how much at the peak? Four or five billion dollars. Four or five billion dollars. And what was, when you were in the Forbes 400, what did they say your paper worth was like? Technically it was never in the Forbes 400, it was a Forbes article. Okay. And it was probably 1.8 billion. 1.8 billion. Mm -hmm. So how would you keep your head about you when the whole world is saying you're a, you know, you're one of the wealthiest people in the world? It wasn't one. Of, no, not even close. No, it, it, the Sun Times said I was one of the wealthiest in Chicago, and that's that's a way different world there. But um, I was first off, I didn't really. How many I, people here have been worth 1.8 billion dollars even for a year? Anybody? <laughs> not me. So. so so All right. I wasn't, it wasn't that long. It wasn't even a year either. Um, no, the reality is this. I enjoyed what I was doing. I had great employees that were doing work for me. I mean, you know, that was the start around the same time Andrew came to work for us. We hired Andrew at our college. We had Andreessen as an intern until he canceled on us. But we, we had a lot of cool stuff, and we had great people. That was what I really enjoyed. I had already gotten to the point where I realized there was far more important things in life than money. You know, I wanted a normal childhood, you know, for my kids. I wanted them to just, you know, grow up in a normal way. I had gotten divorced because I worked too much, you know, and it was not, a, it was a very humbling experience. Um, I didn't live that lifestyle, and I just, I, I saw too many people that did, and they burnt out. You know, all the Microsoft gazillionaires that basically went up, flamed out, and died. Um, and then also, when you're hanging out with, like, Bill Gates or Michael Dell, Michael, there's a good one. Michael Dell, I was talking one time, and he goes, oh, yeah, I said, yeah, so, said something, I said, yeah, I all this shit about being, a, I, I'm sorry, getting all this grief about being um, a billionaire from all my friends. He goes, don't let it bother you, it's a nice thing to have. And, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. And then he goes, um, oh, but you know what, um, five sixteenths. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, if Dell stock goes up five sixteenths, I'm worth as much as you are. I, my, my increase, I increase by how much you're worth. That was a very humbling experience, <laughs> you know? And so it really didn't phase me. And also, the problem is, once you get, everyone has a number. Ooh. Um, the difficulty is, everyone starts in the life with a number. If I had a million dollars, boy, I'd, I'd live a great life. And it, oh, the number is always an even number, too. If I had $5 million, $10 million, today people... And everyone, if you ask someone, and they're being honest with you, they'll say, if I had this much money, I would do, and you could do anything you want, I know what I would do. I wouldn't be doing this, I'd be doing something else. And the difficulty is once they start to get to that number, and for me it was a million dollars. I thought, if I had a million, I'm good. Well, I got to a million, and I'm like, well, that's, not, that's nice, but maybe five. And then it's 10, then it's 20. And it becomes this, this, this hill that you, you never will attain. And Gates was one, you know, give me one time he said, I would trade half my net worth if I could be anonymous. I mean, the days when he used to be able to fly on United Airlines, take layovers in Chicago, no one knew who he was, were just his best days. And no matter where we went, we were at Wendy's one time, and someone came up to him and said, you're Bill Gates. He looked up and he said, if I was Bill Gates, would I be at Wendy's in Chicago? And so I was like, you bet. That's, I told you it wasn't him. But he did. Wendy's is his favorite place to eat, still today. 
So, I mean, if you want to be a big hit with them, take them from Wendy's bag. It's a good thing. But I, I was hanging out with these people, and they were keeping me very grounded. But more than that, I never identified with it. And it's one of these perpetual treadmills. And people do it all the time. As soon as you say, oh, I got to go on a vacation here. I got to have this. Now I got to fly my own plane. Now I got to have my own house. It just, it's a never-ending cycle. You're not so, happy if that happens. So talk a little about the end of Latte, because you then rode down. It was yeah. good that you were humble, because the dot-com bubble burst was painful for a lot of people, and you, you had been grounded the whole way through. But talk about that kind of, that, that uh, um, because you had a lot of dot-com clients. Yeah, yeah. I, we had a lot of them. I we mean, were one of them. You were one of them. <laughs> um, Starbelly, Eric and Brad was one of them. Um, a lot of guys. Um, we basically... We're, at that time, we had committed to building, I mean, we built 350 different companies at Lante in those last few years of our existence. And, um, but the problem is they were all dot-coms, and when their money dried up, they couldn't pay us. And so if they couldn't pay us, we, we couldn't did pay, pay our employees. We did pay. We always paid all, you. Not, every, not all of our clients did. But um, so we were in a situation of, like, just realizing that, you know, we had to, you know, restructure our business. And you want to talk about entrepreneurs. I mean... Andrew was a great one. He came in with two of his friends and said, you know what? I know you're going to lay a bunch of people off. Andrew Sage, Andrew the founder Sage of Kikira, who's yeah. the January 28th, the next founder. And, and he came in and said, you know, we're going, to, we're going to start a business. So why don't you just lay us off and we'll take that money and we'll use it to start our company. He's a brilliant guy. He's done a great job with it. But at the same time, you go through all this. It's a humbling experience. Lante went from, we went public at 20. We went up in the 80s. And we came and we were at 55 cents. We were, our stock price was less than the amount of cash we had in the bank. No one believed we were going to do it because you look at our clients, they were all a bunch of dot coms. We had laid some people off, and it was just not a pretty scene. And so the guy who we had is. We did have Ann. We did have Ann. Ann was a great customer, and we did a lot of work. And several people are still at Ann, our old long time employees. Ann was a great customer. But you were too, I mean, when you were your first startup. But um, what we ended up with was a situation that. The CEO was very good at while the company was building, doing a good job. I hired him back in 99. So, but by the time one comes around, he's not doing as good of a job because it takes a different type of personality. So the board came back and said, I want you to run the business. I'd already been a single parent at that point for uh, four years. I was enjoying my lifestyle with my kids. My kids were very important to me. I had enough money. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I basically said, but what I will do is make sure we land well and basically I stepped down as chairman, which was shocking to a lot of people, and I went out to find a way to sell the business. And so I had an idea, because we weren't alone in this dot-com crash. I mean, we were down 55 cents a share. I mean, I, when I brought in investors in the, in the, in the 97 time frame, it was, a fract it was multiples of that. So I'm like, this isn't right. And so I basically, but all of our competitors were like that. So I went and found a company who did not go public, company called SBI Group. I know three of the four founders out in um, Utah. And I said, you know what? Buy us. Use our cash. Let's go out and buy all of our competitors. And so I went out to buy all seven of our competitors who were just as crushed as we were in terms of stock price. We bought five of the seven. We pulled them together. We split them into two companies. We took the first company and sold it to a Quantiv, which then got sold, which was headed up by Brian, Brian Andrews, who then went on, is now the chairman of Grubhub. Yeah. And, uh, and also the CEO of um, um, the music uh, company. Um, Pound, I can't remember. That's Spotify, the other one. Anyway. No, Pandora? Pandora. He's the CEO of Pandora. So um, basically, we went off and walked through you know, this thought process. He bought the business. He then grew the business, sold it to Microsoft. Microsoft eventually sold it out. It's Razorfish across the, street, uh, across the hall from uh, 1871. And... Um, we then took the other part and sold it to Perot Systems, which then got sold into Dell. But at that point in 2004, Latte was sold. And it was done. And so you're, you're off being a good father with your family. Um, and somewhere in the story, you built Answers.com. And this is an interesting, interesting one because your retirement, you're very focused on your kids, and I always respected that. And you had a great, you used some of the money to have a house in Lake Geneva, I know. Which oh, I, that was my one splurge. A lot of us in the dot-com money days in like the 98, 99, had a little bit of extra ching tang in our pocket. The old established, you know, people all had houses in Lake Geneva. I love going to Lake Geneva. So I'm like, I'm getting a house. We all looked at it. We all ended up buying houses that fits our style. So I bought an old fixer-upper. You, Farrow. Farrow was another one. Yeah, yeah. Ken Ruck from Yes Mail. 
Um, but yeah, there's a few of us. So you're, um, so talk about how you came up with Answers.com, the story of Answers.com. Okay, so in, we sold the business in April of 2004, transacting in July of 2004. And I knew it was done, and I knew I wasn't. Brian McAndrews wanted me to be on the board. I said, no, only, only paper. He goes, take paper in the deal. Take stock. I said, the only paper I want has Benjamin Franklin on the front. I want cash, and I'm done. And so I was done. And so I went up to the, I spent the whole summer up in Lake Geneva. And so I went up there, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to my roots. I'm a programmer by background. And so I, we had done so much in new technologies, but I never got the chance to do it because I was running, you know, we had 1,500-some people. I was running the business. I couldn't really get down and say, hey, I want to roll up my sleeves and work on this project. So I thought, I'm going to learn new technology. I'm going to go build it something. Well, if you're going to build something, you've got to think about what you're doing, and you have to solve a problem. And what problem? goes back so to the, what you so said So it goes before. back to your made. first tweet. Right. <laughs> I'm not putting it as a tweet. I, I got a good record going with tweets. But um, basically, I was like, all right, my son had a problem looking something up on Google. Back then, if you want to look stuff up on Google, you got a list of links. You got to go to them. It took you to the top of the page, and you had to look through whatever that page was to try to find the information we are looking for. Didn't have jump tags or anything like that we have today, or even any of the features of one box today. Um, and so I thought, that's kind of cool. I'm going to write a program, and I'm going to learn you know, um, MySQL. I'm going to learn PHP. I'm going to learn Python. I'm going to learn how to program in all this open source stuff, because that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so I, that summer, the kids were off taking their, their lessons, doing yeah, you know, the sailing and stuff like that. I was sitting home programming. I was having a great time with it. And at the end of the summer, we come back, lived in the suburbs. People had heard about the transaction at that point. They said, what are you doing next? I said, I don't know. I'm working on this. And I showed them what I was working on. People were like, that's cool. I'd use that. And what we I decided to do is I built a, a database system that had all of the information about whatever topic you wanted to look up on one page. Why should you give them multiple pages? Put it all on one page and just make it relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. And so I um, started showing people. They thought it was cool. And so I, one of my friends who I had helped start a business before thought it was cool. I ended up, he had a patent I wanted to use, so we ended up merging the, the two companies together. And with that, we, um, his CTO, who happened to be a guy who I met, and I introduced him, even though they were in Israel, they were in Jerusalem, Israel, the CTO I met at Mark Ackler's first company, when Mark Ackler ran a software development company called Whitewater Group back in the 85, 86 time frame. And this guy was a programmer. Made some money when Atlas sold Whitewater. And he said, that's it. I'm doing what I want to do. He had his FU money, just like you know, everyone has a number. And he moved to Israel. And so he was a brilliant technology guy. So I introduced him to my friend, you know, decades later, like a decade and a half later. They became friends. They worked together. So he took him, looked at my code. That's a really nice start, but that's pretty amateurish. And he rewrote my, all my code. And, uh, but we launched that website. The concept stayed the same. We launched that website. I bought the domain from a bankruptcy lawyer over in Michigan for what originally he wanted, um, three quarters of a million dollars. We got it down to 80K, which was a lot of money. Um, but we bought it. And with that, we, uh, in January of 05, launched Answers.com. We took it public in October of 05. Because one of the people who saw it early in, in 05 was Marissa Meyer, who said, I really like that. Could we use this? When the, the person who's designing the landing page of Google asks if you can use it, you have one answer. Why, yes. <laughs> and so we did. And so she's like, I just want to you know, tweak a couple things. And so she, we'd go back and forth. And within three weeks, we were on almost every, we started result pages in parts of the US. And within about four weeks after that, we were on results pages worldwide. And wow. we were getting huge traffic. And the guy I was working with, we had a great engineering group over in Israel, and it was just, it was blowing the doors off of our, of our service. But it worked. Fantastic. So I want to go to some audience questions here. They've been voting, which I really appreciate. So the number one voted question, which is always a great one, what are some of the startups you've invested in recently, and how have they grown with your support? Um, I like investing in Chicago startup companies. Um, and I've been, you know, either directly or indirectly through the, some of the funds like CV that I've invested in. I've invested in, I just did a calculation, you know, because I've, my wife's like, you got to update the spreadsheet. So I started it. And I've got right now 74. I just literally made the 74th investment today, which coincidentally, I, I bring that up as an example, um, because that's the first one I made that's not in Chicago, or the Midwest. Um, it happens to be with the partner who I started Answers with. He's got a new company. So he's like, I want you to invest in it. 
Will you come be on the board? I'm like, I'm not being on the board. I'm not working with you on it, but I will invest in this company. So I invested in that. That was number 74. Wow. And uh, any companies you're on the board of, startups? No. So no boards? Um, I take that, oh, no, no. I take that back. I, I, my apology. I am, I, Enova, which Al Goldstein started, and was, he sold into Cash America. Then he stayed with, but then he left, and Tim uh, Ho ran it, and then he left. Um, David, David Fisher? Fisher is the CEO. David Fisher, is, they're spinning it out from Cash America. He went to a few of his friends and said, I would like to put you on my board. Would you be on my board? And so for the first time in, since Lante, I'm going back on a board. I'm going on Enova's board when they go and spin out. Oh, great. And so that'll be, but no, in terms of startups, I'm not on any board. I mean, I've got, look, Packback is a great company. They've done a lot of great things. They've been asked, but it's not, I work better as just being able to be a mentor because when I want to travel, I don't want to have any guilt like I'm letting someone down. Mm -hmm. So and it just takes some time off. Good. Um, was design a strong focus in, any, in your companies? Uh, yes. Um, it wasn't initially. Well, design always is a good focus because you have to make stuff that people work, want to use. But um, with Lante, when we started getting into the websites in the 94, 95, 96, I mean, we built some of the best. I mean, we worked on Schwab. We worked on the referential engine for Amazon. We worked on American Airlines, American Express. I mean, it's always got to look good as well as work good. So, yeah, the design became real important. As a matter of fact, in 98, we bought a design company here in town because we were basically, we were doing about, we were like 80% of their revenue, and they decided to try to raise their rates on something. I'm like, give me a break. You can't do it. We, we, and so we ended up negotiating and just buying the business. Uh, people want to know, I like always, uh, we do this primarily as a taping. We like to get the live um, audience questions as well. So one here that I don't know the answer to, so I'll just throw it out, is how do you know Mark Cuban? <laughs> um, so, all right, so I started my business in... I don't like to answer, ask questions I don't think I know the answer to because I don't want to put you in a bad spot. But. No, no, it's very simple. I started my business in August of 1984. Mark Cuban started his business two weeks ahead of me, which is... Um, and then he ended up selling, and then he started another business, which he then sold for a gazillion dollars. Um, but I'm no, when we would show up, remember I said we'd, we'd go in like Lotus Notes, we'd be the ones always on the new edge of technology. We would show up, Lante would show up, and Microsolutions would show up. So Cuban and I got to know each other. He's like three years older than I am. We've been friends since then. And so, yeah, so whenever he comes to town, I always end up doing it. And when he invested in Packback, I got the phone call saying, are these guys for real? So, and, you know, he did the investment in Packback, and he's done a great job for them. Um, and just, yeah, so I've known him for a long time, 30 years now. So what do you think people don't understand about Mark Cuban and the popular conception? You were just going to give me a crush with all of your friends. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, they're all, I think, helpful insights. I don't think they're... I'm not saying, like, what's their deep, dark secret. Just, like, what do you think, you know, what do you think people don't know about or don't understand? Like, what, I think sometimes when people are really well-known, they say, I think the public understands sort of the media perception of me. What's the, what's... Mark Cuban is very good at creating a media perception of himself. Yes, he is. He is, um, but he is also very caring and is very um, driven by ethics and principle. He will do things because it's the right thing to do, but he will also have a lot of fun doing it. Um, you know, he's just a great guy. I mean, he's, he's another one. Super smart, but really quick to ask questions of people of what others think, and is it a good absorber of other people's perspectives. Interesting. I said, he's a great, great PR guy. When he got in trouble for that, can't run a Dairy Queen. Could manage a Dairy Queen. He comes around, and he goes out, and he becomes the manager of the Dairy, Dairy Queen for the day. That after awesome. calling in every television crew within, like, a 50-mile radius of Dallas to get him to do it, and he had the little Dairy Queen hat on. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Okay. Um, you've gained many accolades as an IT guru and businessman. What is the biggest mistake he made? Um, Work-life balance. I was, I was, when we were growing in the mid-'90s, 95, 96, 97, 98. Um, it was heady times. I mean, we were doing, like, I mean, to do Microsoft's website and to make a change and make a typo and put it up there and see it is a, kind of a heady thing. Being asked by Microsoft to fly around the world and speak about how their technology is being used as technology, heady times. Um, but I ended up in a situation where I was working a lot. I mean, 80-hour, you know, I would say on a, on a slow week, I was probably working 60 to 70-hour weeks. And on a busy week, I probably would work 90 to 100-hour weeks. 
Now, still see the kids. You, know, you, you go and you go home, you make sure you tuck them in bed, and then you do email and stuff like that. That work-life balance got a little out of whack, and I basically ended up getting divorced. And that was probably the biggest mistake I made. You've got to remember, work is important, but so is family life, and so is your friends. And if you've got to maintain a balance of all those things, I mean, I'm getting grief right now when I, when I said, you know, I'm going to start teaching at the University of Chicago instead of going back to a startup. Everyone's like, why are you going to do that? Why don't you do another startup? Because I'm not, I know myself. I don't have that throttle. If I get so enthralled and excited about what I'm working on, I just start consuming the time of it. And, you know, all of a sudden, going to bed at like 2, 3 in the morning, getting back up at 6 was no big deal. You have the adrenaline, and it just drives you. But I can't do that because if I do that, then I will be single and I will have a terrible relationship. So as, I don't want to have that. As his wife laughs and right, yeah, yeah, nods yeah, in the front up. row yeah, here. Yeah. But the reality yes, is Robin. I won't do a startup because of that. But more than that, that was, that was a big learning opportunity for Why me. Why not go on the boards? Why not boards? Because there are so many great technology companies here in Chicago. And, I, and I, I'll work, any of them I've invested in, either directly or indirectly, if they have a question, I always have time for them. Um, and I will help them in any way. I'll make introductions for them. I'll, I'll do all kinds of stuff. But at the same time, if I do boards, I don't have enough time to do a board commitment. Right. Because it seems at that point you're picking favorites. I mean, there's a company here in Chicago. And I'm thrilled they're a Chicago company. It's a, a guy I met a year and a half ago down at U of I. He's a mechanical engineer who got into doing software. And then he went, he's finished his PhD, but he's not filed it because he doesn't want the information to go public. And he has got, a, it's called Rhythmio and I am invested in it. And if I ever thought about being on board, this would be one of them. Because first off, everyone would assume that he's immediately going out to the coast, getting in with all the chip manufacturers and stuff. This guy has got a way of looking at repetitive uh, information and separating the noise from the, the data and giving you a great way to basically do gesture recognition that has been untouchable anywhere around. And he's got Apple, Samsung, Intellisys, Intel, Everybody wants to work with this guy. This guy. And so the, the opportunity to see and what they can do is just so awesome. I mean, same thing with Kit Kura. I mean, when, you, when we get ready, you do your background on Andrew, let me know. Because I remember the three founders, and then I was the one who mediated the meeting when two of the three said, we want to split up. I was like their mediator saying, okay, let's figure out how we can, you know, because the reality is I, I don't want to be. So after that, Andrew's like, oh, you know. But the reality is. If I pick, go on certain boards, it seems like I'm picking favorites, and I don't want to do that. I want to see so, the so whole I just, ecosystem I wanna, grow. I want to make sure people understand what a big decision that is, because you know you give time to these companies. You, you teach at Booth. You, right. you, you're on the executive committee here with CEC yep. with me. You help us at Chicago Ventures. You help all these companies. But when you're a board member, you get equity to do it. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of equity that sweat equity you're putting in that you're not necessarily getting equity for. And I think that shows you. Uh, I don't need the money. No, I but I think that lots of people say that. You, you evidence it in how you give. You're willing to give without getting. And I think that's the pay it forward that makes tech community great. No, when I started here in Chicago, I mean, I, I knew nothing about the technology community. I helped start the Chicago Computer Society in 1983. In the fall of 83, because there was nowhere where people could get together and talk about computers. Now, you want to talk about the Uber Geek Fest. That was a good one. But <laughs> I mean, we had people, we had like 30, 50 people showing up for meetings. That was it. That was the Chicago com the community. Right. Um, we have done so much to grow. We've had a few landmines along the way, kind of put big pots in the, the soil, and we've had to recover from. But the reality is the community has come together so long. If I can help make the Chicago technology and entrepreneurial community better, everybody wins. Because bottom line, we should be on par with any technology, entrepreneurial environment in the world. So that gets me to my favorite um, last two questions. And there are so many great questions that people will ask you afterwards. But it's uh, um, so much great and so much interesting here. But uh, the la second last one we always ask is companies that you're particularly excited about. If you were saying, who are the next companies that aren't on people's radar? but you think will be as the next big, the next grub hubs, the next brain trees, who would, who would you identify that may not be as well known to the broader um, community? Um, well, Rhythmio is one. I think they, when you see the technology, it's, it's just impressive what he can do. Um, Raise, 
that does the um, the buys and sells gift cards. Raise.com. It's yeah. another one. George. George just does. He's done a spectacular job. Um, I don't know. There's there's a lot. I mean, uh, New Current. If you really are into the antennas, I did not invest in them because I really wasn't drawn to the hardware component of it. But they they've got a lot of promise. Um, Hology has done great work. I think they've got a, a huge promise ahead of them. Um, Packback, I think, is changing the model and can really do a lot. I mean, there's the, the beauty and of where we are today. And I think people don't understand. Oh, Kikura's Kikura is another one. Kikura is, Kikura is amazing. So is um, Go Health. Right. I mean, Acuity, the one I remember I said we had shown at was Chris Dalton. He sold the business for $319 million, barely made a blip here in Chicago. That's wow. an amazing accomplishment. And Kikura, Kikura is going to blow them away. I mean, Kikura is the, they just put their head down, got into a niche, and they basically have done a great job. They really have. And, and they, they, they they a lot of people don't know who they are. He's starting to get a little bit more visible because he's doing a, a little bit more charitable stuff and things like that. So he, they pop up. But he really is uh, like what I would love to see more and more of entrepreneurs in Chicago. Just did his job, built a great product, has great customers. And is giving back to the community. He's another one who's, you know, you, you need a tech uh, entrepreneurship thing sponsored. He's always ready to write a check. No, it's great. So the last question we always ask, and you've been an important part of this community for a long time. What do you think of Chicago as a place to start do startups today? Uh, and and what, what do you think are our strengths? And people also want to know what do you think are some of the challenges we still need to work, work on or work through? We're getting some pa past some. Let's start with the challenges first because that's easy. Um, Challenge in the past is if you were associated with a failed startup or a failed business, you were tainted. Bad, bad decision. And in the Valley, it's a badge of honor. Here, it's, you're, you're, it's like a scarlet letter. And I think that's wrong. That's um, we're changing that around. But it has to not just change within the community. It has to change with the bankers, the lawyers, and the like. The, there also has to be this sense of community. We're starting to see it now with certain law firms. Back when I wanted to do it, every time I wanted to do anything with a lawyer, it was always charge, charge, charge. Today, you've got lawyers who say, I'll help this startup get started, just pro bono. Phenomenal development. Bankers who say, I, I understand your business, I understand you, but I'm going to loan you some money with some tight reins, but I'm going to loan you some money. Or angels. You know, when I was around, I was like, why didn't you take out any funding? I couldn't find anyone to fund me if I had to. You know, and it just basically was one of these, I was able to flip it around. Today, there's a great angel environment. And so those are important. I mean... Look, I, I think you see a lot of the companies, all boats rise together. So we have to work together as a community. Now, why should Chicago be this? Pretty simple. If you go out to the valley, yes, there's a lot of people out there, but it's expensive as all get out. I mean, I was talking to um, a student the other day who had an internship. He was paying $3,500, and he slept on the floor a month. $3,500 for his rent. Wow. That's what it is. I mean, it, and you, the traffic sucks out there. I mean, it's just... Everything you could ever want in a bad work environment exists there. However, it's, it's an ecosystem and it's a creation and it's very well connected. We need that here in Chicago. And people need to be willing to work together and, and pull that pieces together. But even more than that, we have great talent here in Chicago. We have to figure out a way to better, you know, get it to move a little bit more smoothly. Modest, another one I think no one's ever heard of. That. What Harper has done with Modest is over the top cool. Hmm. And he is going to be one of these that people go, wow, that's brilliant. Um, and you see this over and over. We have to figure out how we can get the, the ecosystem to work better to allow people to interact and learn from people like that. Um, but more than that, we have to have the, the belief. We're so fortunate to have great schools around here. I mean, I look at UIUC, you know, from when I went to school there till today, it's still one of the top five computer science programs in the world. They're turning people out that are world class. They feel compelled to be successful, they have to go to the West Coast. But they don't. It can happen here. We have to figure out how to make that happen. And that's the burden. 1871, CEC was started, what, 15, 18 years ago? Mm -hmm. And it, it, most people, again, a great unsung hero, most people didn't know what it did until we did 1871. Now everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's so funny to watch that, how it's been able to mature and develop. We need to do that across the board with other things and all learn how to work together to make that happen. Because we have a great style of living here, we have a great cost of living here, we have a great work um, environment for people, we have a great lifestyle environment for people. And so we just need to basically allow people to work together and build that up and be more accepting of what entrepreneurship can bring to this community. Well, you're a great leader, but a great story. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic.